So Paul and Silas set a young girl free. And what happens to them? They lose their freedom. You see, that's the price of redemption. Redemption is setting someone else free. We're going to see it again in just a minute. The, re the, the price of redemption is the loss of freedom for the Redeemer. The price of freedom is the loss of freedom for the one who sets free. That's what happened to Christ. John 18, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the arresting party arrives with Judas. Jesus said, Whom do you seek? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus says, Take me and let these others go. That's a picture of substitutionary atonement. Take me as a substitute. Let them go. Paul frees the girl. He's beaten. He's put into the inner prison. And his feet are fastened in with stocks. He can't move his feet. What do you do when that happens? What do you do when you are beaten up and imprisoned and tied down for doing the right thing? Well, I don't know what I would do, but I know what Paul and Silas did. They sang. They sang praises to God and they prayed. It says in verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. It's, it's interesting. It wasn't prayers of petition. It wasn't, Lord, get me out of here. It was prayers of praise. Okay, now, I told you that probably Acts 2 is the most important chapter in the book of Acts. Probably Acts 9 is the second most important chapter. Acts 2, of course, is the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Acts 9 is the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Two huge events in the history of the church, in the history of the world. But I tell you that my own favorite chapter, the most important chapter to me, is Acts 16, the chapter that I would least want to do without, is chapter 16. Right now, I'm going to show you what I think is the most important thing in chapter 16. You will never understand ministry unless you understand what happens here. You'll never understand missions unless you understand what happens here. And you'll never understand freedom unless you understand what happens here. Paul and Silas are singing hymns of praise. And look at verse, the end of verse 25. The prisoners were listening to them. They're thinking, what's with these guys? These men are different. They've just been beaten up. They've just been thrown in here with robbers and killers and rapists and bad people. And the prisoners know that these people are good people and they're bad people. And they're singing and praising God even though they've been unfairly treated. And the prisoners are very intrigued. At that moment, there was a great earthquake. Verse 26, the foundations of the prison house were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer had been roused out of sleep and had seen the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now look at verse 28. Paul cried out with a loud voice and said, Do yourself no harm. We are all here. Let me just say that I can't give you a principle. I can't give you a formula which covers every case. The reason I can't do that is because in Acts 9... Paul did escape. He did run away. He went over the wall in a basket in Damascus. And in Acts 12, an angel came to take Peter out of prison. But in this place, they don't leave. They stay. I've been to Iraq 17 times. 
Every time I went, I was scared. Every time. Every time I went, I thought of what might happen. Had I been taken in Iraq by people who hate Christianity and hate Christians, and had I been locked up in a place, and if an earthquake came, and if the doors were open, I tell you what I would do, I would run out. They didn't run out. They stayed. Now, here's the secret. Here's the reason they stay. Here's the key to, here's, here's the key to ministry. Here's the key to missions. Why did Paul stay? Because he was already free. He was already free. It was the, it was the jailer who needed to be freed, not Paul. Paul was already free. In um, in Genesis 22, which I think is the most important chapter in the Old Testament. That's the chapter about the sacrifice of Isaac on Mount Moriah. Abraham raises the knife. God sends an angel to stop him. Do you know why God could stop Abraham from killing his son? Because God was willing for his son to die. See, there had to be a substitute. There had to be somebody taking the place. Somebody has to die if sin is going to be paid for, if holiness is going to be satisfied, if we are to be set free. So when the jailer raises the sword over himself, Paul, like the angel in Genesis 22, stops him. And he says, don't hurt yourself. We are here. You know what that means? He says, you don't have to hurt yourself because we are willing to be hurt. You don't have to die because we're willing to die. We're willing to die so that you don't have to die. You know what happened to the jailers in Acts 12 when Peter got away. They were executed. So what Paul is saying is, you don't have to be hurt. We're willing to be hurt. That's why we're here. The most famous recent date in American history is September 11th, 2001, 9-11. When we dial an emergency number on a telephone in America, we dial 9-1-1. So on 9-1-1, there was a great emergency. We have a lot of famous days. December 7th, 1941 is a famous day. That's the day the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. November 22nd, 1963 is a famous day. That's the day that John Kennedy was shot. But December 11th, 2001 is the most famous day in recent American history. On that day, the two tallest buildings in America are on fire. Black smoke pouring out of them. And there are two groups. One group is running out of the building, out of the two buildings. The other group is running into the buildings. Now, the group, the group who is running into the buildings, they have on a certain uniform. They have on the uniform of the New York Police Department. Or they have on the uniform of the New York Fire Department. Or they have on the uniform of New York emergency workers. Why are they running toward the danger instead of away from the danger? Because their calling is rescue. Their calling is salvation. Their job is to save. And there were many rescuers in that, those buildings when they fell down. And they lost their lives. Because they wore a certain uniform. 
they had a certain identity. Well, Paul was wearing a certain uniform. It was a uniform of salvation. He had a certain calling. He had a certain identity. So he says to the jailer, no, 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 don't. You hurt yourself. We're not going anywhere. Now, the amazing thing is that all the prisoners stayed. They had heard these men sing. They had heard these men pray. They knew that the earthquake came because of Paul and Silas. And they weren't going anywhere unless Paul and Silas went. There are two amazing things about this passage. The first thing is that Paul and Silas didn't leave. And the second thing is that the prisoners didn't leave. That's how strong an influence their praise and thanksgiving had upon those prisoners. Now, if you read the book of Job, the devil has an argument. And the argument is this, oh sure, sure Job praises you. Oh sure he worships you. The reason he praises and worships you is because you've been so good to him. You've been Santa Claus to him. You gave him everything. You gave him wealth. You gave him health. You gave him this fabulous family. Sure, he praises you. But if you hadn't given him all those things, if you took, took those things away from him, he would curse you, which is the argument of Job's wife. So what happens when you lose the things which would cause you to thank the Lord and to praise the Lord? What do you do? Then you thank the Lord and you praise the Lord, not for what He gives you, but for who He is, for He Himself. And when you do that, that's when you have the powerful, powerful impact on the unbelievers. That's when you influence people to pay attention to the God of Israel, who's your God. Who is this God who is so good that people praise Him and sing hymns to Him when they suffer and when they lose everything? Who is a God like that? Well, he is the God worshiped by Paul. He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. The jailer called for lights. He rushes in, trembling with fear, and he falls down before Paul and Silas, just like Cornelius fell down before Peter in Acts chapter 10. And he says, this is the great question, Acts 16, 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, one reason that Acts 16 is so important is because it's got one of the great evangelistic verses of the New Testament in it. There are many great evangelistic verses in the New Testament. Titus 3, 5, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, John 3, 16. But one of the most famous is Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household will be saved. If they believe, they will be saved too. So they spoke the word of the Lord to him together to all who were in his house. Evidently, the jailer lived at the prison. And he brings the apostles into his living quarters, dresses their wounds, ministers to their wounds. They'd been beaten, remember, but no one had taken care of their wounds. So the jailer and his family wash the apostles because they've been beaten up, and then the apostles wash the jailer and his family in baptism. 
they profess faith in Christ and they are baptized. It says that He brought them into His house, verse 34, they ate together, they rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with His whole household. Here's the interesting thing. The next day, the judge orders that Paul and Silas be released. Funny thing about Paul, he's not willing to let it go. I think most of us would say, that's great, let's get out of here. Paul doesn't say that. He says, we're not going anywhere because you have beaten us illegally. You have beaten a Roman citizen without a trial. And you see, they didn't know that they were Romans. And then they began to be scared because they knew that they had treated Roman citizens illegally. But they leave the prison. Once more they visit Lydia's house and then they leave Philippi. You know, when you read the book of Philippians, and by the way, this is, remember, this is one of the great reasons for the book of Acts. If we don't have the book of Acts, we see this letter to the Philippians, but we don't know anything about what happened in Philippi. When Paul wrote Philippians, he was in jail. And he talks about prayer, and he talks about the Philippians praying for him in Philippians 1. But he doesn't ask them to pray that he'd get out of jail. He says that maybe he would be released, but he doesn't ask them to pray that he would be released. And can you imagine when the, the epistle to the Philippians is being read in the church at Philippi, who do you think is sitting on the front row? The Philippian jailer. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.